Dan, you, uh, Lance was talking a lot yesterday about third down being a, a pretty key part of your offense's success so far. Um, I, I wonder just what you've seen on third down, but also what you're doing maybe on first and second to put yourselves in more manageable spots. Well, it, you you, well, you kind of hit the nail on the head there with the idea that you got to make sure those manage the, the third downs are manageable. You got a whole bunch of third longs. It's just a, it's a long Saturday typically. Um, you know, so first of all, credit to our kids to, you know, establish, you know, some efficiencies on first and second downs and trying to gain first downs on first and second down and maybe try to avoid third down altogether. Um, but we talked, you know, if you remember maybe way back at the beginning of the year about how our shift has kind of gone from, hey, let's just avoid playing bad football, which we'll continue to emphasize to let's play better situational football. So, um, you know, you know, of course, every, you know, as long as I've been a coordinator, you know, you, you have plans for third downs and things like that. And, 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 you know, and you, and you, and you, and you implement it and you practice it. And I think the kids have understood, um, you know, and to their credit, they've understood what, <clears throat> how important it is for us to stay in the field and they get it. So, um, you know, I don't know, there's nothing that I'm seeing per se, you know what I mean? It's maybe, it, it's, it has a lot to do with our success on first and second down. Yeah. How much fun is it to be in that situation? Yeah, one, you know, when you talk about situational football, you know, if you can stay out of those third and five plus down of distances, that's when the defensive playbook is wide open. And if you're dealing with your first and second downs that are, you know, at least less than 10 typically, and you're, you're third and one, two or three, your playbook is still pretty open. And, um, you know, it's, you know, football, it's not complicated. We say, you know, it's about avoiding predictable situations. And if you can stay out of those, then you got a chance. So. Thanks. You know what I mean? Appreciate you bringing that up. <laughs> well, you know, again, we'll go back to staying out of predictable situations. Turnovers and sacks, the most common down that, that those occur are third downs. Right, so if you can stay out of third downs where you got to drop back all the time, um, uh, you know that that's a part of it. Uh, it's a credit to our offensive line and everyone else involved in the blocking game. We are dropping back the amount of, the amount of time that he's he's had to to throw a ball. Uh, it's a credit to um, the rest of the offense to execute in some you know on first and second downs to be able to you know be where they're supposed to be. You know when when we talk about bad football interceptions and sacks and and, and turnovers, um, you know. There's this book, it's called Outliers. If you haven't read it, it's fantastic. I get no royalties, by the way, by promoting it. So um, there's, a, there's a chapter in there called The Ethical Theories of Plane Crashes, and it talks about how planes crash, and it's usually a series of little things that, that mount up, right? And we talk about turnovers, and we talk about sacks. It's usually a series of little things. It's, a lot of times it's not just, hey, the bad decision by the quarterback. It's usually something that you know, is compounded with the receiver not running the route at the right depth or the left tackle, you know, maybe oversetting it causes the quarterback to be under, you know, under duress and have to throw quickly. And so it's usually a lot of little things. So, you know, to, to avoid sacks, right, to avoid the plane crash, so to speak, it's about a lot of little things probably getting done correctly, you know, and I would say. So between the offensive line and their development, um, the kids going out there and executing what we're doing in the normal down and distance situations, stay out of those predictable situations and you're going to have fewer sacks. Absolutely. I think their entire defensive line does. I think this, this box uh, that, that we're playing again is very, very uh, explosive and twitchy. You know, I mean, we'll have our hands full up front for sure. You know, it's, it's, it's a strength of theirs. Their secondary is very aggressive. You know, not, not to talk about <clears throat> their whole personnel here, but, you know, they, 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 they replace some man covers. They're going to challenge our receivers, okay, which is going to, uh, you know, not allow you to have a bunch of rhythm and timing throws as a quarterback to get the ball out of his hand as quick. So, uh, that allows the defense line to pin their ears back, right, and get to the quarterback a little bit more. And so um, for us to stay out of those predictable situations will be big this week again. With, with your option game, what, what made you want to put it in and, and what did you think of it last week? Uh, I think it's been good. It's been efficient, you know, right? I think, you know, um, you, you mean, you go back and look at last year. I mean, we were running quite a bit of option stuff with, with, uh, with the quarterbacks, you know, then as well. I think that... It is a, it's a neutralizer. You, you, I think maybe in this room at one point we've talked about how you have to be able to defend against what we call plus one box, right? At the end of the day, football is very simple. If they've got a bunch of guys in the box and you can't throw it, it's a long day, right? And if they don't have anyone in the box and you can't run it, it's a long day. It's just the way it is. And so what are the things are you doing when there's an extra guy in the box? And so a lot of times, you know, one of the answers is maybe to be able to read somebody. And so to, to gain that, the numbers back, so to speak. And 
Um, so we've always had that in, right? We've always had answers that way. Um, but I'm happy and pleased with how it's going. You know, I think our, our guys, um, they understand the, that, you know, that's, that's part of our identity, part of what we do, part of who we are, ways that we create distortion on a defense and all the things that complement it. Um, you know, it, it, for us, we, again, it's about being efficient, but it's about finishing those drives and being explosive and it allows us to create some explosive plays. Yeah, I would say all of our quarterbacks been able to do it well. Sure. You know, yeah, I do. I, I think, um, and it's the reason we're doing it, right? We've talked here before about personnel. Then that needs to dictate what you do, and so you have a group of quarterbacks that can run those things pretty well. Um, you need to do it, and you got backs and receivers and all that stuff that can handle it and do it as well. Have you always had that in your playbook? Yeah. Um, yes. To answer your question, the, the growth of it is what changes, and. Um, you know, and again, I think I've talked about this year before. You always have these small little pieces, you know, these little Lego pieces, so to speak. And uh, sometimes they need to grow and be stacked upon a lot more based off of your personnel and where you're at. So, um, you know, you still can't be a jack of all trades and a master of none. You still make sure you have to have an identity uh, and go out there and do what you're training your players to do um, and be right on why you're doing these things, right? And that goes back to the evolution of where you are as a, as a team. And every week we have to evolve. Right, so this this week coming up, we have to have, take another step and evolve again into the kind of things that we're doing. Well, a lot, right? So we, you have to figure out how to put stress on the defense. You have to figure out how to, as an offense, what are the things that you're doing to challenge the defensive players. Uh, and there's a lot of ways to do that, right? Motions and shifts, playing really fast, like using tempo, okay. Um, you know, they have the ability to like check plays and things like that. These things are all stressful. But reading individuals, right? You know, and, and you know, and everyone across the country does this stuff that people call them RPOs though, right? You know what I mean? Everyone, we do too, but um, you put stress on defenders when you start reading them, right? And you start making them decide, are you gonna be involved in the run game or this part of the run game or are you gonna defend the pass or whatever it is. So, um, I think any time that we can prom promote and put stress on a defensive group, that's really good for our players. But we have to make sure there's a yin and yang here that as much stress as we're putting on them, what are we capable of handling, right? And so we're able to do a lot of things because our guys, you know, we've, we've gotten some depth, we've gotten some experience, we've been here for a spring football now, right? You know what I mean? And so there's some things that you, can, that you can start building upon and guys are getting a lot of what we call banked reps at things. Um, I think some parity, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, you can't sit there and single out a guy and be like, mm, you know, right. And so strength in numbers matters, you know, right. And, and, and the fact that you have a group of guys and you see them rotating in and you see guys, you know, reps count kind of balancing out. Um, so to evaluate that consistently through a spring and a fall camp and say, you know what, these guys are, they're consistently executing. They might not be. Flashy, they might not have Mel Kuyper coming in here, grade him as a first round draft pick, do you know what I mean? But they're, they're, they're executing and they're getting it done and they're being productive. And at the end of the day, when you talk about playing good offensive football or well, good football in general, it's about being productive. And so you see production from those guys on a consistent basis, which is why fall camp and spring football is so important so you can consistently evaluate those things for guys, right? Because it's one thing to have a good practice, right? Or one good game. It's another thing to start stacking them together. And you see the guy making contested catches over and over again, or you see the young man running great routes over and over again, or whatever it is. That gives you a lot of confidence to say he'll be able to consistently go out there and get it done. And two weeks in now, I guess, what has impressed you most about what you've seen from that group and the production that you've seen from them? Well, <clears throat> When their number's been called, they've showed up, first of all, right? So, so when the ball's been thrown their direction, for the most part, you know, we've been, we've been pretty good about catching it, right? Um, and we, we ask our skilled players in our program to do a lot, right? right? It's not just line up at the outside and play the single receiver to the left, right? Um, we have very much a pro-style system with our guys. Um, the things that you see on Sundays, right, from those guys and the receivers and where they line up and they move, we ask our guys to do that. And so the fact that they've been able to pr be productive and then for us to be able to do things with them in terms of motions and alignments and personnel groupings and all that stuff, it's, that, that, it takes some teaching and learning on their part, and then they, are, they fully accept that, embrace that. Jalen, you have been connecting a lot early in the season so far. Can you just talk about the chemistry that they've developed 
not only on the field, but off the field as well? Well, I guess I can't speak a ton about their off-field chemistry. I don't hang out with them that way. But um, on the field, I mean, it goes back to these reps, right, that we're talking about and how much, you know, trust is garnered in either way. And it's something that is just consistently, the bucket is continually, you know, just gets full and gets full and gets full. So for them, to, him to be out there practicing, for those guys to work together and get reps, um, and not just to Q, but to all those receivers. And I think that you can see that group is really developing. Coach Samuel has been doing a great job with all those guys, um, you know, to learn what we're doing mentally, but to go out there and get reps, know what they're doing. And so the quarterback and the coaches and themselves can say they're confident and that guy's going to be able to go out there and get that done. Well, I hope it's hard, you know. That's kind of what we want to be able to do. I hope it's challenging for them. Um, part of, you know, some of the things that we do, why we do the things that we do and kind of where our offense has evolved to is, you know, when my first full-time job, I got to coach on defense, right? And I, and I was coaching the secondary, believe it or not. And, um, you know, you start to figure out what really puts stress on you as a coach. Like, oh, man, we got to figure out how to line up to this or we got to defend this, right? Or we got to figure out how to stop that guy. Um, Again, you, sitting on the other side, you learned what put stress on us as defensive coaches and then be able to you know, kind of flip the script and make sure that they understand that. Again, keeping it in balance to make sure that you aren't doing things that are counterproductive to your efficiencies, right, and your ability to execute. Um, that's big. And that's, that's the balancing act of coaching and teaching, right? And that, that's the hard thing. That's, that's one of the hard parts of the job. So um, I, I hope it puts a lot of stress on people. That's what we're trying to do. Talking about Skinner, Q, you said? Yeah. Um, well, I hope that he continues to be consistent. And when his number gets dialed up, he's able to make a play. You know, you know um, those explosive plays are, are huge to drives and being able to finish them and score touchdowns. So we want to be able to continue seeing that. And he's been good. And I, I've said this before, you know, him and a lot of those other guys, we were able to line them up all, all everywhere on the field. And um, to be able to help create matchups, be able to help put them in positions to be successful. Um, and again, that, that, again it, that takes some learning on their part. Um, you know, going back to, to maybe, you know, your question about the, 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 the trust and the, and the rhythm that he, they, he has with the quarterbacks, it's, I think um, it goes back to that whole group and really a lot of our kids on offense about just their commitment to prep preparing and saying, okay, I'm, I'm going to do more than just, you know, what we do on the practice field, you know, and they get that. And, we, you know, they, and they all want to play professional football, and we want that for them. And I promise you this, when those guys who are professional athletes and they're every week working for their job and their lifestyle, they're spending a lot of extra time on their own making sure that they know their playbook and making sure they know their game plan and et cetera. So Q's been doing a great job of that stuff, and so have those other guys. Well, the best indicator and the best test is when it actually happens in games, right? And so to see that, right, in a game, you go, okay, guys, look and see how you responded the right way to, to these moments. You just got to keep swinging and swinging away, right? And we try to paint the picture for them to get them to understand the things, everything that we do from the off season to fall camp and spring football, the things that we do to put adversity on them, to teach them how to respond in those moments. Um, I, you hope that it starts to sink in. And, and we talk all the time in offense about, we start every meeting and talk about the being, that being the difference. In one play, one thing. And you have to assume that every play that you're, about, you're playing, it, it will be the difference in the game, right? Because you don't know when it's going to come up. You have to assume that this is the big play that's going to occur. My backside block is going to be the difference for a long touchdown run. Or my read or my alignment or my split or whatever it is. And so to go through and hammer the details to the guys you know, in moments when we can teach them in fall camp and spring football. To do that in the off season with the training program, couple that with moments of adversity, practicing out in the heat, dealing with a bad practice. Because I'm just going to tell you, nobody goes through all of fall camp without a, you know, a bad practice, right? Nobody grades out all of fall camp at 100%. And so every one of our players uh, has had the opportunity to grow, right? I mean, that's the beautiful thing about what we do in coaching and teaching. It's, it's 
it's there's growth and there's daily improvement. And so one of our biggest things is our core values is the ability to be process oriented, right? And, and trust it. Okay. You could have won by 50. You could have lost by 50. What we were going to do the next day wasn't going to change, right? It's about, Hey, this is great. You play great, but here's where we still have to improve. Okay. Now, and I think I've said this before, and I think as we've grown as coaches, you spend a, we're, we're way better about explaining why we do things. And so when moments show up in a game of us getting something done correctly, okay, so I'll give you an example. Lawrence Arnold had a catch. It was a third and six maybe, a third and five. I forget what it was. He caught it underneath the sticks, but he immediately got north and south and got the first down. And we're in the meeting room, and we point out a year ago, that doesn't happen. We mess around, look around, get tackled, fourth and one, got a punt or decide to go for it. And so we point out moments like that, which is a great job for Lawrence to be trained that way, to understand it, and to go out there and execute the game, to point out moments like that to say, hey, here's why we do these things. And I know they're mundane, and they can be monotonous, and you're not going to want to do them, and they're not fun. But you got to freaking do them because that's how you improve. And it doesn't need to be complicated and sexy. Just do them. Do them with good attitude and good effort, and they're going to start to show up in games. So for us to have success in those kind of moments, and that, that's a specific one, right? Maybe you can remember, maybe you can't. And to do it, you hope that the light bulb goes off even brighter for him and other people and say, hey, listen, when we're going out there on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, Thursday for practice, we're doing these drills for a reason, you know? So long answer to your question about resilience and adversity, but I think it, it, it's important because it's so much bigger than just, hey, you know, hey, we were down 14, we came back. No, man, it was way before that came up that we're trying to get ourselves in positions to respond that way.